Good to see you guys here this morning, and um, I'm, we're, we're, we're going to get blinds, just so you guys know. We, we have two windows back here in the back. We're getting blinds this week, so hope the sun's not beating on my my forehead too bad, you know. So you guys, we tried to make it to where, uh, yeah, I had to slide the pulpit over. There's a windshield out right out there, and it's glaring right back in my face, and, uh, and so uh, we're going to get blinds this week to, 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 to solve that problem, but... Um, but it is good to see you guys here. Those of you who are tuned in live on our Facebook, uh, we welcome you here as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's good to have you guys join us by way of uh, social media and the tech world. Um, um, I got a couple of things to share with you real quickly and briefly. Then I'm going to jump into the word. But um, we're going to give our attention this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 25. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 14 through 44. Now, real quickly, just a couple announcements, and I'll get through these real quick. Uh, this week, men and women's group are canceled. As a matter of fact, we're going to cancel men and women's group uh, for a season. And uh, what we're doing is uh, we're going to combine the two groups. What, what, I guess an easier way to say it is we're going to have a midweek study just for a season. Um, I was getting ready to teach the men um, the book of Revelation. We were going to go through the book of Revelation verse by verse. And some of the ladies found out we were going to go through Revelation. And so some of the ladies want, us, uh, want to join that study. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a midweek study for a while. It's just going to be uh, the, uh, the book of Revelation, and then we're going to come back and do men and women's groups again. So uh, that's going to start July 28th. Uh, again, with a study, a verse-by-verse, in-depth study on, 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 on the book of Revelation. Um, I serve on the board of another Calvary Chapel. It used to be Calvary Chapel Raleigh, but they've changed their name uh, to Calvary Chapel Oak City, but it's still there in Raleigh. Um, uh, th- these guys are doing an incredible work in Raleigh. And I want to, I want to share this with you real quick. Um, the pastor there, his name is Ricky Ruda. Great guy, really good friends with him. And what they've been doing is really interesting. Uh, at the very beginning of COVID, they were meeting in a building that um, uh, because of COVID and all, they weren't allowed to meet anymore. And so they're trying to figure things out, like, man, where are we going to have church and where are we going to meet and stuff? And so they just had this random idea to go um, to this hotel in um, a lower income, bad neighborhood of of Raleigh, and they set up church out in the parking lot, and they just do church. And man, let me tell you something. Over the last couple of months, it has become so successful. I mean, this thing has grown. And what they do is they... They bring all of the sound equipment out. They bring everything out. They set it all up. There's tents. There's vans, all this stuff. And, um, and they just have church. Now, when they were meeting in the building, they had, I think it was like 15, 20, maybe 30 people at the most coming to church. And those people, they'll show up Sunday morning. They'll serve, and they'll still have church and stuff. But since they've been meeting out in this parking lot, hundreds of people hundreds of people are coming out for the church service. And, um, and not only are they just doing the church service, they're helping these people. They're feeding them and they're giving them clothes and provisions and stuff like that. Well, I got a call from Ricky last night and Ricky told me that, um, um, the way they've been getting their food is the food banks in Raleigh. They'll, they'll give them food and they serve it on Sunday morning. Well, the food banks in Raleigh have, have dried up. They can't get food anywhere. And they really want to continue serving these people and continue ministering to them and all. And so what, uh, what Ricky did last night, Ricky went out with his own personal money and he spent $200 on food to go and, and feed these people today. They're, they're having service right now as we're having service. And um, um, I thought it would be cool if we as a church could just pray and, and maybe come alongside of them. Um, he says on average, they spend about 100 to 200 hours a Sunday because, li- listen, hundreds of people they're feeding. We're not talking about like 20 people. Hundreds of people are coming out 
and they're just doing a good work. And they spend about 100 to 200 hours um, every Sunday, and, um, and right now they just need some help. And so if you feel led to help Calvary Chapel Oak City with this, this, uh, this you know, what they're doing there on Sunday morning, just come talk to me for some more information, or you can write a check and in the memo line put for Calvary Chapel Oak City, you know, and we'll, we'll make sure that they get it and stuff. So speaking of uh, giving, you guys know right now we're not passing any uh, uh, tithe baskets and all. Uh, the, the, the boxes are on the wall, the tithe boxes. And uh, we just thank you so much for faithfully giving and, 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 and being obedient to that. Uh, last thing for me, and then we're going to jump into the Word. Um, we have some uh, openings right now for people to serve. And um, you guys know uh, uh, the media booth back here. Bill's back there right now. And Bill right now is running the live stream. He's running the sound. He's running uh, some other stuff, you know, the, the slides, all that stuff. And uh, he's, he's, he's got like four or five hands back there just going all crazy, you know. And, um, but we need some people to serve in the media booth. And um, um, you, you don't have to know everything. You know, we'll show you. We'll, we'll train you and stuff like that. But um, but if if you feel led, if you know, after praying about it and after 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 really considering it, you know, please come talk to me or come talk to Bill. You know, because uh, we we need some help in the media booth. You guys know, last Sunday uh, we had a dedication service and we talked about going into the future and stuff. And we're we're trying to um, spend some money. And, and upgrade our online presence. Right now, we just have Facebook Live, and it's working for now, but the sound and the quality is not that great. And so we're trying to buy a camera and trying to go through our website and having a nice live stream service and all that. And, uh, and again, we just need some help in the tech world back there if you guys would just consider and, and, and pray about it. So, Well, let's open our Bibles. If you're not there already, 1 Samuel chapter 25 is where we're at today. Again, we're going to give our attention to verses 14 through 44. It's a big section, but we're going to take it on and get through it. It's an exciting passage, um, and I think you're going to enjoy it. The first service enjoyed it, and I think you guys will as well. Father, we love you. We love your word. We ask that you would speak to us in a mighty and powerful way through your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to share a story with you real quick. We were, my wife and I, se several years ago now, uh, we were young in marriage. Uh, we, were, we were raising a, a one-year-old. Uh, that was Kayla at the time. Uh, we, were, we were going through the process of buying our first home. Um, uh, we were transitioning back to life in America after spending almost two years in Germany. And then on top of that, we were just uh, took over the leadership of uh, of another church, Calvary Chapel, Elizabeth City, where we were there. We were there for nine years before coming here. We had a tremendous amount of responsibility, and 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 we tried the very best we could to maintain, I guess you would say a a disciplined life in order to balance all of the responsibilities that we had. And, you know, maybe you can relate to what I'm saying. Maybe you can relate to it. You have a lot of responsibilities in life, and you're just trying the very best you can to live in according to God's word, to live obedient to the Lord, and just live a life that's pleasing him and trying to balance all of these responsibilities. Well, there we were in the midst of really trying not to fail at the things in this life. And, 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 and in the most inappropriate way, this particular person decides to make our life extremely difficult for us. I, I, I won't go into the details of what happened, but I will say this. I was extremely unhappy over the situation, and I became extremely angry over the situation. And I'd like to stand before you this morning and tell you that I immediately sought God's help, and I immediately prayed for wisdom and, and for direction, but, but, but I, I, I can't. I can't say that. I have to be honest because the Lord knows my heart. Instead, I stewed, I stewed thoughts of what I'd like to say to this person. I stewed thoughts of what I'd like to do to this person. And um, 
I won't tell you any of those things either. But can, can, can you relate to what I'm saying? Um, well, let me tell you, God is a God of grace. He put a woman into my life who was beautiful and wise. And by the way, that's my wife, Jesse. <laughs> And, and, and I can still remember sitting down with my wife to talk about this matter. And, and, and I was fuming. I was stewing. I was stressed out, frustrated. Um, the things that I wanted to do were not right, were very close, if not sinful. And, and, and I remember just asking her, you know, hey, what do you think about this situation? And the things that she suggested sounded like wisdom from the Lord. And I knew after talking to my wife, I knew that she was right. I, and I knew that I had better listen and heed to the words of my wife um, or I was getting ready to make a, a terrible uh, decision and a terrible mistake. Um, well, the context of our passage this morning is very similar to that of my own story. And I hope that you'll see as we make our way through it how relatable this account is to your own life. You're going to see a woman in this passage. Her name is Abigail, by the way. And you're going to see this woman suddenly step into David's life. And what she does is she saves him from almost committing a terrible act uh, uh, against a man who brought uh, a lot of difficulty into David's life. Listen, it's a great passage. And because it's so long, the whole chapter is 44 verses long. Two weeks ago, we studied the first half. And then we had a dedication service last Sunday. And then today we're going to study the second half. Um, so allow me, just because we had a break, you know, it's been two weeks. Allow me just to briefly review of what we uh, studied two weeks ago, because it really gives us a running start in what we're going to study today. David and his 600 men are still living as fugitives on the run from King Saul. And they're making their way across the land of uh, Israel. And it's rugged and and, and wilderness and all, and, and they're always living one step ahead of capture. Um, well, for a short time, David and his men have settled near a small village named Carmel. And it's here we're introduced to a man by the name of Nabal, and his wife, her name is Abigail. Now, Nabal is very rich by ancient standards. This is what we're told in the first half of the chapter, that he has 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And as we noted in our last study, his name also means the fool. Um, uh, um, that's what Nabal means, the fool. And it's probably a nickname given to him by others. Um, it's easy to understand why people would call him the fool, because in the description given of Nabal, we're told not only is he rich, but we're told that he's harsh and evil in his doings. And, and so people nicknamed him the fool. Well, at some point during their stay in Carmel, Nabal, the fool, he makes a deal with David and his men. And it's quite simple. David and his men have a, a, a very easy job to do. All they have to do is protect the shepherds of, 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 that, that work for Nabal and protect their herds and their flocks. And in return, they're going to be rewarded for the service. So David and his men agree. They provide the service and they, fulfill, they faithfully fulfill it. And now it's time to be rewarded. So David sends 10 men to Nabal to collect the compensation for their service. And what does Nabal do? You guys remember. First, he refused to pay David. And second, he insults David with a series of brutal comments. And so these 10 men, they come back to David and they say, David, look, we need to explain something to you. And look, not only did we, uh, um, we, we didn't get paid, but man, this guy just ran you down in the dirt, man. I mean, he just, I mean, he just publicly humiliated you with all kinds of, 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 of just insults. And what does David do? Acting rashly, without thinking about it, without seeking the Lord, without praying, he becomes so angry that he decides that he's going to go and kill Nabal and kill every male that works for Nabal. And so he tells 400 of his men, he says, get your swords, get ready. We're getting on the road. We're going to Nabal's house. Now, with that in mind, only for a moment, I want you to think of how you would have responded to such a matter. 
And, and let me say, I, I, I want to encourage you not to be self-righteous in the way you think about David in this account. I mean, be real, right? Uh, what, would, what would be in your mind? <clears throat> You've just faithfully fulfilled your end of a deal. And, 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 and then not to be paid, but to be um, um, slapped with a series of insults? What would be in your mind? What would be in your heart? What would you feel? What would you say? What would you have done? You know, put yourself in the moment. David's story is your story. You know, isn't it true? People don't always treat you with respect. People don't always treat you with love. You know, isn't it also true that in each one of our lives, at one point or another, we have rashly thought how to bring revenge against those who have wronged us. Isn't it also true that we have thought about the pain that we've suffered and thought about how much pain and, uh, that we can bring against the person who brought pain against us? I mean, it's true. We live in a world where people treat us unfairly and people treat us um, 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 not with love and, and such things. And if we're honest, we can relate to David in his present circumstances. Well, this is where we left off the last time we were together. At this very moment, David and his men are making their way to Nabal's house, and, and David's mind is set. He's a very determined and angered man. He is going with one purpose and one purpose only. Uh, he's going to kill Nabal, and not only is he going to kill Nabal, he's going to kill all the males of his household. Well, come to verses 14 through 17, we have a dramatic turn of events. Look what happens. Now, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. And they were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel that no one cannot speak to him. So listen, put yourself in the scene. There's this young servant, and he comes to Abigail, and he reports Nabal's actions to her. He told Abigail how David and his men protected the shepherds and protected the flocks. They were faithful in doing it, faithful in keeping their end of the deal. He told how Nabal refused to pay them for their service, and he also told Abigail how uh, Nabal publicly insulted David. And somehow this servant knows that David and his men are on their way to Nabal's house, and it's not going to be good when David gets there. And so he reports all these things to Abigail. She has a decision to make, and she has to make that decision fairly quickly. Look what happens, verses 18 through 20. Then Abigail made haste, she was very quick about this, and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seahs of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on a donkey. And she said to her servants, go on before me, see I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So it was that she rode on the donkey, that she went down under, under the cover of, of the hill, and there were David and his men coming down toward her, and she met them. So uh, again, acting quickly, Abigail gathers up generous portions of food, and she has them sent with provision bearers to intersect David and his men. The food includes a typical Israeli diet. Um, it's, it's, it's bread and wine, lamb, grain, raisins, figs, some good stuff listed there. And, and, and having sent the food ahead, Abigail quietly snuck away and she went to go meet with David. But make sure you notice, none of this was told to her husband. She stayed completely quiet about it. Now, verses 21 and 22, changes the scene to David just for a moment, and then we're going to come back to Abigail. So now David had said, surely in vain, I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him and all, all he has repaid evil for good. 
And, 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 and may God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. So make sure you understand, Abigail hasn't met with David yet. She's on the way. And, and so the scene shifts over to David and, and, and his men. They're making their way to Nabal's house. And what we just read here is that as they're making their way to Nabal's house, David is still angry. He's still grumbling over the matter. We, we, we would say that he's stewing, right? I mean, he's just like on his camel or donkey, whatever he's riding, and he is stewing over the matter. Someone tries to say something to him. He's like, don't talk to me right now. He was just mad and angered. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> He's thinking about Nabal's insults. He's thinking about how ungenerous of a man he is. He's thinking this guy is really a fool. A fool. He's also rehearsing exactly what he's going to do when he gets his hands on Nabal. Should I kill him quickly? Should I let him suffer for a while? What should I do? He's thinking about these things. He's going to kill Nabal and every male that belongs to him. Listen, these are the thoughts and these are the words of a very angered and determined man. So back to Abigail. Look what happens next. Verse 23. Now, when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed to the ground. I just want you to think for a moment how remarkable this is. Riding alone into an army of 400 men who are armed and bent on violence, bent on destruction, Abigail rides right into him, dismounts off her donkey, bows down with her face to the ground. It's a way of showing respect and submission. Abigail is absolutely amazing right here. And then while she's bowed down, she speaks. Look at what she says, verses 24 through 31. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as, as, as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass... When the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without a cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Wouldn't you agree? Abigail speaks with such remarkable passion and with such remarkable wisdom. I want to just briefly take you through what she says. She begins by pleading with David to place all the blame on her. Now you got to remember, David is a very angry man right now. And we know when someone is angry, they're unstable. But he's a very angry man right now. His heart is full of a murderous rage. And, 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 and this is, this is a, a bold move by Abigail. It's a bold move. There in verse 24, she says, On me, my Lord, let this iniquity be. She's appealing to David. Hey, look, you want to take your anger out on somebody? Take it out on me. David would have understood 
that Abigail was attempting to save the life of her husband and attempting to save the life of her entire household. And David knows that this woman, none of the things that have happened is her fault, but she's willing to take the blame. She's willing to take the consequences upon herself. This is absolutely admirable. Surely this statement had to have softened David's heart. And then she asks for forgiveness in verse 28. She says, please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. And again, why is she asking for forgiveness? None of this was her fault, but she's willing to take the blame and she's willing to suffer the consequences. David's got to be thinking to himself, man, this is a remarkable woman. Man, she's awesome. She, I mean, she's willing to do all of this for her foolish husband and for her entire household. If this didn't soften David's heart, nothing would. And then take note of what she says. She encourages David of the blessings that the Lord has promised him. We won't read through it, but I'll just mention it to you. In verse 28 and then in verse 30, uh, Abigail reminds David of the promise that he's the chosen and anointed next king of Israel. And so Abigail reminds David of this. He, she reminds him of the great promise that God has for his life. David, you're the chosen and anointed next king of Israel. You will have, and she uses this phrase. I love this phrase, by the way. She says, you will have an enduring house. Man, I love that phrase. You will have an enduring house. And really what she's driving at is this. David, listen to me for a minute. Why is such an, 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 an honorable and great man as you ready to kill a foolish man like my husband Nabal? I mean, David, you're better than that. And then in her closing remarks, she does something that wasn't usually accepted by women in ancient times. She appeals to David's conscience. And we're told that in verses 30 through 31, and it shall come to pass this is Abigail speaking. It shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you nor offensive of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. In other words, what Abigail is saying, in other words, David, you don't want this blood on your hands. How much better it will be when you become king and not have to look back on a time when you stretched out your hand and killed this guy out of the vengeance of your heart. David, what she's encouraging David to do is, David, leave this in the hands of God. God, God, God says several times in his word, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine. And Abigail is pleading with David don't make the mistake. David, you go, if you go and do this, if you go kill my husband and my household, you will regret it for the rest of your life. And so she encourages him to leave the matter with God and let him deal with it. I, I got to ask, is there a better response? Abigail comes to him. She's willing to take the blame. She's willing to take the consequences upon herself. She then asks for forgiveness, although it wasn't her fault. She encourages David in the promise of the Lord for his life. Then she appeals to David's conscience. Her, his, his conscience. In, in everything she does, we see greatness. She is prompt in her actions, generous in her gifts, wise in her words. It's very clear that she cares more for her family than she does for her own reputation. This, my friends, is a remarkable woman. Well, she's finished speaking. Has her words penetrated David's heart? Has her words softened David's heart? Has her words, you know, even heard, been heard from David? Does David still want to kill Nabal? Well, look at it here, verses 32 through 35. Then David said to Abigail, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me and blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light, no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received her or excuse me, David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, go up in, in peace to your house 
See, I've heeded your voice and respected your person. You see this, David gratefully accepts Abigail's gift of food for himself and his men, and he makes it clear that she has succeeded in softening his heart and changing his mind. David recognizes the fact that Abigail is literally a God sinned and that by means of her words, by means of her deeds, God has used her to keep him from committing such a terrible act as murder and shedding blood. You know, David was smart enough to realize something. Although he was rash in his decisions, he was smart enough to realize something. Now, let me just park here for a minute and share something with you guys. David was smart enough to listen to correction and counsel when he was wrong. And, and listen, listen to what Proverbs chapter 15, verses 31 through 33 says. The ear that hears the rebuke of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is, is humility. Also in Proverbs chapter 15, we're told this uh, 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 later in the proverb. It says, he who receives correction is prudent. My friends, I want you to understand something. How we receive correction and how we receive counsel is a test of our relationship to the Lord and our willingness to obey his word. After hearing Abigail's correction and counsel, David wisely admits that he's wrong. He's like, look, I'm wrong. And not, not only did he admit that he was wrong, he takes it a step further. He thanks Abigail for her words. And then he takes it a step further than that. He acknowledges that God had used Abigail to stop him from committing such a, a terrible, sinful act. It's not often that we admit that we're wrong after we've been corrected. It's not often that we thank the person who cared enough for us to stop us in our tracks and to give us godly wisdom and godly counsel on a particular matter. And it's not often that we acknowledge the hand of God working in our life through another person's corrective words. But David did. And so we should learn from David how we receive counsel how we receive correction is a test of our relationship with the Lord and our willingness to live by his word. Now, just a quick side note, and this is the beauty of teaching verse by verse through the scriptures. Um, we get to cover certain topics as you get to them. But I want to mention something to the husbands sitting among us this morning. You know, husbands, I've learned just as you have learned that um, we have a lot on our plate. And, and it's easy for us to get stressed out. It's easy for us to get anxious. It's easiest for, for us to get frustrated. It's easier for us to want to fix everything in our household and, 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 um, and, and do it in our own strength, in our own wisdom. Um, but husbands, I want you to know something, and you're hearing it from me. Men, there is nothing wrong with sitting down with your wife and just saying, babe, honey, whatever you call your wife, what do you think about this particular matter? There is nothing wrong with that, men. There's a lot of men, a lot of husbands that their pride causes them not to say anything to their wife. They're like, you know, what? I, I'm going to fix this. I don't need to talk to my wife. I'm just going to stay stressed out and frustrated for a while. <laughs> Guys, I've, I mean, I've been there, man. But listen, oftentimes I have learned that when us husbands are stressed out and anxious and frustrated and it's so hard to get in tune with the Lord, Oftentimes, God will speak through our wife to us on a particular matter. I've seen it in my life on several occasions. I've seen it in the life of several other men. So, men, there's nothing wrong with that. Just humble yourself. Go to your wife. Hey, look, I got, got this situation going on, or you know the situation going on. 
I'm just curious, what do you think about it? You will be amazed at what your wife says. Amen? Amen. Well, back to our text. By her quick response, Abigail has saved David from his folly and his guilt, and she has spared the life of her husband and her entire household. Now, David has sent her away in peace. Now, Abigail is going to go back home to her husband, Nabal, um, and, and this gets interesting real quick. Look at what happens in verses 36 to 38. Now, Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And, uh, and Nabal's heart was merry within him. Remember this, remember, remember this line right here. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. Then it happened after about ten days that the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. I love the Bible. <laughs> Nabal is completely oblivious at how close to death he has become, or he has come because of his foolish actions. There he is throwing a feast, and we're told the feast like a king. He has no idea that David and 400 men were on their way to kill him and his household. But there he is, feasting like a king when Abigail returns home. And notice this, he's merry at heart. But why was he merry at heart? Because he was drunk. Another side note, do you know people like this? The only time that they're happy is what? When they are drunk. It's absolutely sad. And then notice Abigail acting wisely again. This is such a remarkable woman. She's acting wisely again. She says nothing to her husband in his altered state of mind. You cannot reason with a drunk. You cannot do it. And so she waits until morning when his mind is a little clear and he has a hangover. And she informs him of all that's happened the previous day. And did you notice... When, when Nabal hears the words and comprehends the magnitude of his foolishness, when he hears his wife say, you know who I met with yesterday? I met with David. And he had 400 men with him. And he was right down the road, Nabal, right down the road. And they were coming to kill you and our entire household. When he hears that news, we're told that his heart died within him and he became like a stone. That's to say that he had a stroke or, or a heart attack. And whatever it was, he stayed alive for 10 more days, probably in a paralyzed state. And finally, we're told that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. It's sad to say, but Nabal lived as a fool and he died as a fool. And now at this point, David and his men have probably begun to move on from the area of Carmel. But notice what happens when word reaches David that Nabal was dead. This is good. Watch this. Verses 39 through 42. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. That's awesome. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head, and David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as a wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose. Watch this. What, let me just say this real quick before we read verse 41. Remember, David is the next anointed and chosen king over Israel. So who marries him becomes what? The queen, watch this, then she arose, verse 41, bowed her face to the earth and said, here is your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. A remarkable woman. I love Abigail. She knows that David is the next future 
uh, anointed and chosen king. Does she say anything about, oh man, I'm going to have a lot of riches. Does she say anything about, man, I'm going to enjoy the palace life. Does she say anything about, man, I'm going to have a lot of authority to do whatever I want. None of that. She speaks from a servant's heart. She says, here's your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. I love Abigail. And in verse 42, so Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. So listen, when word reached David that Nabal was dead, David responds, again, blessed be the Lord. And then he says, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. David responds with wonder and with gratitude. He praises the Lord for bringing vengeance against his enemy. And listen, David now sees how much better it is to have left the matter with God instead of taking the matter on himself. God took Nabal out, not David. And that's the way it's supposed to be. David wouldn't ever be able to praise the Lord in this matter if it wasn't for the wisdom and the counsel of Abigail. If it wasn't for Abigail's quick response and quick words of wisdom, David would have went and killed Nabal. David would have went and killed all of his household. And then for what? An insult? Because he didn't get paid? Is that a reason to kill somebody? David would have regretted it for the rest of his life. And Abigail saves him from it. It's absolutely remarkable. At any rate, David knows what a tremendous woman Abigail is. So he sends messengers to Abigail's home with a simple message. The messengers show up. Hey, Abigail, what's up? David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. So Abigail doesn't need to be asked twice. She quickly bows to the ground, once again showing respect and submission, and humbles, or excuse me, and humbly accepts the offer. She gets up, she's accompanied by five maidens, and follows David's men to his place, wherever he's at, and becomes his wife. Now, <clears throat> the last two verses of chapter 25 are interesting. We're not going to go too far into it, I'm just going to make a few comments and then we'll close. But look at the last two verses, verses 43 and 44. David also took Ahinam of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives. Come on, David. But Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Paul T., the son of Laish, who was from uh, Galeum. So listen, David takes Abigail and Ahinam as wives. So he just took two wives in one day. Remember, his first wife is King Saul's daughter, Michael, but she has been given to another man now that David is living the life of a fugitive on the run. And so I won't get too far into this because we're going to come across this matter again later in our study of David's life. But I do want to say this, just because the Bible faithfully records polygamy, it doesn't mean that God approves of it. You understand, there's so many people, critics and skeptics of the Bible. Like, oh man, you know, there's so much polygamy in the Bible and stuff. And you know, how can you Christians do this and this? Listen, just because the Bible faithfully records it, it doesn't mean that God approves of it. And I can tell you right now, as we make our way further into the book of Samuel, as we make our way further into David's life, you're going to see that David never followed God's plan for marriage. And because he never followed God's plan for marriage, he had a terrible family life. Yes, David was a great warrior. Yes, David was a great king. But I'm going to tell you right now, David was not a good father and David was not a good husband. And the reason why is because he didn't follow God's plan for marriage. And what is God's plan for marriage? One man, one woman. That's it. One man, one woman. As a matter of fact, you're going to see, again, as we get further into David's life, you're going to see that some of his greatest trials, some of his greatest hardships come from his own family. 
because his family life was so messed up. We'll come back to that later in the book of Samuel. But as we conclude our time together, allow me just to share with you very quickly two lessons that we learned from this passage. First, I can't help but to think, and I want to speak boldly on this matter if you'll allow me, but I can't help but to think that there may be someone sitting among us this morning, someone listening to the message by way of uh, um, uh, Facebook Live, um, who is in a similar marriage to that of Nabal and Abigail. And if we had to label that, we would label that an unhappy marriage. And listen, if you're in an unhappy marriage this morning, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. If you're living in such a marriage, there is tremendous encouragement for you from Abigail's example. Um, One of the most important lessons we can learn concerning Nabal and Abigail's unhappy marriage is that Abigail does not become the fool that her husband is. You understand? Listen, if you're living with a Nabal, and this goes for men and women, both, if you're living with a Nabal, if you're living with a fool, listen, it's very important that you do everything you can do to resist becoming like them. Do not become like the fool he or she is, but continue to be the spiritual person. Continue to be the one that seeks after the Lord. Continue to be the person that, um, that glorifies God, the one who obeys the word and, 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 and the one who um, you know, prays and, and lives a, a, a life that's pleasing to the Lord. You be that person. It is possible, and I'm telling you because I've seen it in so many marriages, it is possible you can be the better person, the good person, the spiritual person in an unhappy marriage. You can be. I'm telling you, some of the greatest Christians, some of the most influential people of the Christian faith have had the most unhappy marriages, yet they pushed through, they stayed obedient to God, and I'm telling you this morning, take my word for it, it is possible for you to be in an unhappy marriage and still be loyal to the word of God and still walk in righteousness and integrity. Abigail is our example of that. And I will personally say this morning, just so it's known, because look, I'll be honest with you guys. I mean, you, 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 you talk about the great women of the Bible and such things. You know, it's like Abigail was always forgotten. It's like she's not listed among the great women of the Bible for some reason. I mean, I put her right there at the top. I personally believe that for what Abigail says and for what she does in this passage, for her courage, for her strength, for her quick thinking, for her wisdom, that she deserves to be listed among the greatest women in the Bible. She's a remarkable woman. Now, the second lesson, and we'll close with this, is that our actions will always affect our outcomes. You hear, you hear me? Our actions will always affect our outcomes. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 tell us this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will, will of the flesh reap corruption... But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now, what that passage is basically saying is that your actions and your attitudes will have a huge effect on your life and will have a huge effect on the life of the people that surround you. Um, Just in this passage alone, we have Nabal, we have David, and we have Abigail. Three people... Three different actions, three different attitudes. You have Nabal. He sowed foolishness. What did he reap? Destruction. You have David. He sowed rashness. What did he reap? Well, we could say, what did he almost reap? He almost reaped disaster, embarrassment, 
and regret if it wasn't for Abigail stepping in. And then you have Abigail. She sowed wisdom, kindness, love. And what does she reap? She reaped the blessings of God. My friends, every day you can choose how to act and how to respond. Will you be a Nabal? Will you be a fool? Will you be a David in this passage? Will you act rashly, not seek the Lord about anything? Or will you be an Abigail, someone who follows the wisdom of the Lord and gives good counsel? My hope and prayer is that this passage and teaching will result in you avoiding foolishness and avoiding rash decisions and instead live each day of your life with wisdom, with goodness, with kindness, joy, peace, faithfulness, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control, and love. Amen? Amen? Father, we love you and we love your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would take the things that we've learned today and embed them deep down into our hearts, Lord. Father, I just want to take a moment to pray over those sitting among us in this building and those who are watching online. Father, I'm asking that you would give us the strength and the courage to live each day of our lives in a way that pleases you. Father, we don't want to live as Nabal, a fool. We don't want to live as David in this passage, at least, with rash decisions. But Lord, we want to live as Abigail sets the example for us. We want to live with wisdom that comes from you and good counsel and with, 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 with love and tenderness and kindness and all these things, Lord. And so would you help us do that by the power of your spirit, Lord? And if there's anyone sitting among us, Lord, that is struggling with someone who has brought difficulty into their life, Lord, would you encourage them with this passage? Would you do a good work in their life right now, Lord? Would you speak into their heart and show them how to act and how to respond in a way that, that really pleases you, Lord? So again, Lord, we love you. And we love your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.